introduction. Miigwech for the invitation to be a part of the work of the hub and um, I'm looking forward to hearing a brief introduction from everybody, but we're going to begin in the way we begin our work, the ceremony that precedes all ceremonies. And this is a, um, an opening ceremony. I'm using smudge and um, I smudge myself and I smudge my drum and I'm going to uh, begin with an opening prayer in my own language. Bojo ni mino gije gon kwen dishnakas wap shishi and dodem flying post treaty nine in Dunjaba Kitchener and Diane mijo medeo jibwe and Nishnabe queen dao I said that I'm flying post I'm from flying post First Nation treaty nine which is up past Timmins uh, in the Timmins area and I live in Kitchener Ontario my Nishnabe name translates to mean I'm shining day woman the one that brings goodness and beauty to the day. And um, I'm Martin Clan, and um, I'm an Ojibwe woman. And um, I, uh, <clears throat> I just wanna say welcome to everybody here. It's good to be here. And um, we, uh, We've been planning for this day for a little while, and I created the uh, the the, the uh, tool, an Indigenous lens, a, an Indigenous inclusions lens for mental health promotion, to help people, to help you all see perhaps what is often hard to see. So, and beginning with ceremony is how. I begin my work and how often within Indigenous organizations we begin our work and so um, I'm going to start with an opening song and it's a gratitude song and um, and it's a way to uh, begin our time together. There's a lot of people on board here and we're hoping that you'll have a chance to get to speak to one another in the small breakout rooms and we'll go around and do a lightning round of introductions so um with everybody with with a larger group it's it's sometimes more challenging to feel the intimacy of the learning together and with that i will open with this song to acknowledge the spirit of the work to acknowledge the spirit of the knowledge to acknowledge the spirit of the day and the spirit within which this webinar is uh, has been created. And this is a gratitude song to creator and to mother earth. Thank you. 
miigwech. Miigwech means thank you with gratitude. And um, I wanted to see who's on line here. If you can, it would be nice to see your faces. It would be nice to see you and um, versus sharing and talking to little black boxes with people's names on it. And, you know, in an indigenous um, way, because, because I'm introducing you to an indigenous lens and a tool for practice, your presence is important. The art of presence is important. And um, the, um, one of the challenges that we have with Zoom and with technology is that sometimes people are often not fully present and they're doing multitasking. And when you're in circle and which we are virtual, this is a virtual circle, is how I would like you to imagine that we're all sitting in this circle. There's um, 29 of us in this circle. And um, that when you see each other, you're giving each other a gift. And the gift is your presence. It's, and presence is becoming more of an art these days. And um, within an Indigenous lens and within how, how I practice, it really, it, it really matters. Now, that being said, I know some people, for whatever reason, have to, can't, 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 cannot have your cameras on. That's okay. For those of you that can be present and, and um, for those of you that can, um, we can see you. I can, for me as a presenter, for me as a facilitator, it makes the world of difference. Remember, I'm Indigenous. I come from an oral tradition. I come from a tradition where we, who, who you are is um, what you do. And there's no real separation. And if I can't see you, it, it, it for me, it kind of, it loses meaning. Being in relationship with you is really important for me as a presenter. And so your, pre your presence helps me. And uh, if I can see you, then in some way I can be, I can relate to you and I can flip between the screens to, to see how you're doing and who you are and um, a little bit about you. And, and, each, and as you all are here together, it is it's something that you can do with each other because you're all over the country. There's 20 uh, mental health promotion projects all across the country. And so it's, it's like time to like come out of your silo and check out above the trees who else is there, who else is in the forest so that you know who your peers are, you know who else is, uh, is in this circle. And so I just want to give you a chance to, in a lightning round, in a lightning round of introductions for each of you to say who you are and um, where you come from. And um, I don't, uh, what the best way to do this was, did we talk about that, Anita and Mariella? Um, is it better to go through the uh, participant uh, list? because it's all in alpha, Eric's nodding, to go through the participant list. See, I can see you, Eric. Um, <laughs> and, um, and beginning with the, uh, maybe beginning with the hub team, just so that people know who you are, very quickly, where, who you are and where are you located? I, and I'm happy to start, uh, at least on my screen. I'm the next one to the right of Kathy. I don't know if that's true for everybody, but I'm also on the top of the participant list. Uh, I think many of you might know me, but hello, my name is Eric Daverna. Uh, I'm connecting from uh, uh, Kitchener, Ontario. Um, and yes, uh, implementation manager with the KD Hub. And uh, I'll pass it over to Carol, who's to my right on my screen, at least. Yes, hi, my name is Carol Murray, and I'm actually quite new to the hub, just started in September. I'm coming from you from New Hamburg. And I'm Aneta Abramovic, and uh, I'm an implementation manager at the hub, and I reside in Kitchener, Ontario. And I'll pass it to Mary Alice. 
Hi, my name is Mary Alice Jolin, and I'm the managing director at the KD Hub, and I am in the small hamlet of Breslau, which is adjacent to Waterloo and Kitchener. And I think that leaves is it, uh, Renata, please. Uh, I'm Renata Valaitis. I'm the evaluation uh, and research manager at the KGE Hub, and I am coming here from Waterloo, Ontario, and I will pass it over to Marissa. Hi, I'm Marissa. Um, I am the events and communications coordinator at KDE Hub. I'm joining from Walkerton, which is also the traditional territory of Saugeen First Nation. And I'm going to pass it over to Sarah Michelle Schaffert. Hi, I'm Sarah Michelle de Schiffert, and I am with the Public Health Agency, the Mental Health Innovation Fund. Uh, why don't we go over to uh, Magali? Hello, everyone. My name is Magali. I'm part of the infant and early mental health promotion for sick kids. Our project is Nurturing the Seed. And I live, I believe, in the unceded territory of the Algonquins, uh, but colonizers call it Merrickville. Okay, Lindsay Kratzel. Hi, Lindsay Nadishnikaz, McLaughlin and Dodum. To Ms. Kaming and Doonjaba. My name is uh, Lindsay Croxall. I apologize, I have uh, getting over pneumonia, so my voice is a little unclear. Um, I'm a doctoral student at Queen's University working with uh, elders at Aquasasani on a cultural revitalization and uh, mobility project. And I am new with the MHPIF. I was uh, with Indigenous Services Canada. Uh, and it's very nice to uh, meet you today. And uh, Thank you very much for the uh, opening prayer and song. Thank you. Stoney, you're next on my screen. On mute, if I can make my fingers work. Um, so St uh, Stoney McHart with the Students Commission of Canada. Um, I'm, uh, I'm currently in Toronto, um, the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Ashnabak, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples, and now home to many other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, um, part of Treaty um, Treaty 13. Um, and I'll pass it back to the master, the puppet master, to pick somebody else. Is that me? That <laughs> Laura's you, direct, Eric. you're next on my screen. <laughs> I, I was trying to come up with a better name, but that was... That, that's what landed to me at the moment with all these connections you have to make. Uh, I think you said my name, right, Eric? Okay, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Laura Struick, and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Nursing at UBC's Okanagan campus in British Columbia. And I am here on the unceded territory of the Silix Okanagan people. And I am also a part of the uh, Hub Resource Collaborative. So thank you. Thank you. Lisa, you're next on my screen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lisa McGuinness, um, project manager with the Agenda Gap uh, project located at UBC on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish peoples. Thank you. Thank you. How about Lisa Gamblin, since I, I said <laughs> she, she heard Lisa last time, and that's my fault. Hello, I'm Lisa Gamblin from the uh, Cedar Path Project with the Paw Family Resource Center, and we are on Tree 5 territory, specifically a Pathback Cree Nation land today. Great, thank you. Brian, you're up next. Um, I'm Brian Gross, and I am uh, uh, work with the Nation of Wellness Project um, on the uh, Currently, I'm on uh, Kukutlam um, traditional unceded land, and our project works at, in uh, Samath, um, Matsqui, and Stalo uh, territory in uh, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Thank you. Andrea. Miigwech, it's Andrea Simpson here. I'm joining you from uh, Prince Edward Island, which is the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kma'ki people. And I work with the Mental Health Promotion Innovation Fund. Nice to be here. Thank you. Alexandra, you're next for me. 
Hi, I'm Alexandra Fortier. I work with Skomendrath, Ontario, um, and I'm sharing the same land as Stony. All right, Emma Shepherd. Good morning, my name is Emma. I'm part of the research team working on the La Sante Montella Sans Path program for Francophone newcomer youth in BC and Alberta. I'm joining you today from the traditional and ceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh First Nations. Uh, looking forward to this morning. Thank you. Okay, Leslie. Hi, I'm Leslie Payne I'm with the MHPIF, and I'm um, joining today from North Vancouver, which is a traditional and ceded territory of the um, Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Thank you, uh, Jenny Gillis. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny. I'm from Nova Scotia and um, I'm from the Positive Solutions for Families program. I'm really excited to be here. Um, we're going to be doing some adaptations for some of our Indigenous communities here. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to learning today. Awesome, thank you. Leandra. Hi, I'm Leandra Miller and I'm with the Families in Transition Project of Central Toronto Youth Services um, coming from Toronto uh, Treaty 13 area, Dish with One Spoon Nations, and I'm so excited to be here with you. So it's such a, such a pleasure, really. Thank you. Uh, Gina. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Gina from the Strong Project um, at Western University um, in London, Ontario. So looking forward a lot to learning today. Thanks. Uh, Danica? Hi everyone, I'm uh, an assistant professor at Sherbrooke University in Quebec and I'm working on the ORPIS program, which is a anxiety prevention program delivered in high school. Awesome, thank you. Just a few left. Uh, Karis? Hi everyone, I'm Karis. Um, I'm a doctoral student at Queen's University situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. Um, and I'm with the Nurturing the Seed program as well as Magali. Thank you. Hey, ensuite, Sylvie. Hi everybody, I'm Sylvie Gravel. I'm, I'm from Ottawa in the east of Ontario, uh, a little town that called Ambrun. Uh, we are on the ter ter territory of the Algonquin. I'm Mitis myself. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. I'm with the early years and we have one of our group that we're working with uh, the Aboriginal and uh, in the north of Ontario. Thank you. Uh, Fauzia. Hello everyone, I'm Fazia. I'm the National Coordinator for the Do Mind Mental Health Program at Community Based Research Center, and I'm located on Amasui West Waikaiken, uh, Treaty 6 territory, also known as Edmonton, and I'm really grateful to be here with everybody to attend this session. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next on my screen is Claire Betker. Hey everybody, my name is Claire Bedker and I'm in Treaty 1 territory, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oju Cree, the Dakota and the Dene people and the homeland of the Métis, also known as Winnipeg. Um, and I just want to say, Kathy, thank you so much for that opening and that song and to center us in a, in a really good place. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Uh, Brianna Potty. I'm Brianna Potty, Senior Development Manager at the Strongest Families Institute. I'm located in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I am a project lead of our Parents Empowering Kids, the Early Years program. I unfortunately won't be able to stay on camera uh, for the whole presentation because I have terrible internet connection right now. <laughs> Looking forward to today's discussions. Thank you. And uh, Radab, if you could introduce yourself as well, that'd be great. Yes, of course. Hi, how are you, everyone? Uh, this is Rudab. I am from um, the University of Toronto, Mississauga. I work on the Sprint project with the uh, refugees, and I'm very happy to attend this session today. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. I believe that was everybody. If, uh, if I did miss you, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I'll uh, pass it back over to Kathy. Thanks again. Miigwech, Eric. Anybody not announce themselves? Okay, so everybody has taken their place in the circle. That's wonderful.
And that's really important for us to be able to take our place in the circle. And that's what we call a lightning round. And um, so you have a, um, you have, I'm going to share my screen here with you, if that's okay. Um, and I made a bit of a presentation because we have such a, we have such a, um, uh, um, to me, two hours is a short amount of time. Training I do is like usually a couple days. And so I'm trying to stay on task with our work today. And so I just wanted to reiterate, I don't know how many people may or may not be aware of this, but I think that in terms of beginning the work that we're doing today with the uh, Indigenous inclusion lens that, um, that uh, to acknowledge the projects that are happening across the country and to acknowledge all the territories that you're all living in and coming from and the, di and the diversity of which you all are living and working in. And I'm not somebody that's gonna read all of this, so don't worry. It's just there to acknowledge that the, uh, the projects, the, the, the diversity of the projects that you're all in and in just, you know, in the event that some of you may or may not be aware of the, um, the, the, way, the, the focus of all of the projects and um, some, some of the projects are working within indigenous contexts. Some are working within rural or urban contexts and different projects use different approaches, have different um, groups of people that, that, that they're working with and are led in a variety of different ways. So by all means, we have a really diverse audience and we have a very diverse group here today. And uh, I, I want to acknowledge that. And when we do the exercises or we're talking about the Indigenous, or when I'm talking about the Indigenous inclusion lens, some aspects may or may not be relevant. Some of you may be already doing that, that's great. And as we move through it, if there's something that we can add to the inclusion lens, please let us know and we can, we can continue to have that lens grow and deepen and become relevant so that it gives people some food for thought. And when, when, we, when I first was invited to be a part of some of the resource development and planning with the KDE Hub, Barb and I had conversations about um, what I thought I would see happening. And I, you know, for me, I know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lack of knowledge and there's a lack of information and that there is, and it's, it's nobody's fault that this is, this is like this because of, because of the education system that has omitted this knowledge. And so this lens will help you. And I began, I began actually uh, doing this work and I, I came up with some questions for you to think about. And if you have your toolkit, if you go to page five of your toolkit, there is a competency quiz. And so it's not something that is that any of you will or will not say it's not a pass and fail quiz. It's, it's more of a quiz to help you arrive at um, where you need to continue to build your knowledge base and some of the knowledges that are important in creating inclusive planning. And inclusive planning within, so, so the competency quiz, it might even give you um, a bit of a tool to have conversations within your projects to talk about, you know, what knowledge already exists within your project about Indigenous mental health and wellness promotion specifically. And um, what do you think contributes to Indigenous mental wellness um, or mental wellness among Indigenous children, youth, families, communities? And these can be worded in different ways. It's, no, it's by no means exhaustive or exclusive. And, uh, it's, and 
it gives you a chance to to think about things like is there anything actually happening is there any kind of dialogue or planning that is taking place in relationship to um, projects and inclusion of Indigenous voices. And I thought of a simple, and many of you already acknowledge this, as like, do you know whose traditional territory you're on or the treaty territory that you're on? And so it was nice to hear some of you with that awareness of the treaty territory, what that, what that means. And it, it, it tells me that there's a beginning understanding of that we are all in a treaty relationship and um then it moves into the language and then it moves into the nations and the diversity of the nations and so this uh this this um competency quiz is um something that you can begin to have conversations about and I'm just going to I'm just going to um, stop sharing for a second here and now that you all have the quiz up on your on your radar I just wanted to invite people if anybody has taken a look at that and if anybody has themselves identified where um where you feel you need to, where you feel your, your awareness and your understanding is strong and where you feel like you wanna to continue to grow and learn, particularly through the webinar, particularly through your ongoing development as your project continues to identify um, how do you begin to include indigenous people's voices? And is there something that anybody knows about the treaty territory that's unique? that that makes the the project area that you're in um, that will drive the, the things that you have to think about or drive the considerations in your own planning do you have existing relationships with indigenous communities with first nations with indigenous organizations in in some of the cities that were named uh, Vancouver, Halifax, you know, in a lot of main cities across the country, Montreal, there are indigenous organizations, Toronto, they have, they, they have uh, a lot of um, large indig indigenous organizations that are responding to all kinds of issues across the country, children and youth, um, women, violence against women, missing and murdered indigenous women, they're responding to issues around land back. They're responding to um, working with men, working with families. There are organizations in child welfare and in existing mental health where, where they're all trying to um, respond to the needs of the indigenous community in, in a relevant and meaningful informed way that begins to acknowledge and some of the projects have a have a trauma-informed approach to them and I think that's really important because when I think about trauma I think about uh, we do uh, we I talk about colonial trauma and the impact of colonial trauma and colonial violence on Indigenous families, Indigenous children, women, youth, um, even on the land and so having an understanding of of that in the in this you know we are right in the era of the uh the aftermath and ongoing of you know in canada there are seven seven thousand five hundred tiny bodies that have been unearthed and every child matters mcgill you, uh you you Mc, Sorry if I'm not saying that right, Magali. Magali, okay. Um, you have that behind you. And, you know, I want to acknowledge that in this country, 7,500 Indigenous children have been buried uh, and have been put in unmarked sites. And Currently, there is geothermal mapping happening with GPS navigation systems to identify these tiny bodies. And so we have arrived at, you know, about 7,500 children. 
And we live in a country where nobody's saying or doing anything about that. And I think that that is, that is the, the, the level of colonial violence that we're talking about. It's not small, it's pretty significant. And the, the, um, the impact of what I call the colonial eraser, which is the omission of truth, the omission of history, the omission of facts, the omission of, of the um, levels of violence and abuse and genocide and annihilation that's happened against Indigenous peoples in our lands in this country. And so the, so the, and I say, and I call that colonial eraser and education has been an arm and a mechanism of that eraser of, of, of wiping people's consciousness so that people don't think about that. Even in this country, I just like walk around and, and, and I'm in, I am, as I begin to talk about it, I, it's hard for me to describe how I feel and how I'm processing that I live in a country that is complacent, complacent about those tiny bodies who are, I'm a survivor of the Indian residential school system. My whole family was put through that system that I have a lot of feelings about that. And I've seen how it's impacted our families and our communities. And so the competency quiz is not, it, it, it's more about helping to make visible what the colonial eraser has rendered invisible. It's not about um, who has more intelligence or who, it's not about shame, blame, or guilt. It's about talking about things that aren't talked about. It's about bringing conversations to the table that get omitted because of, so there's kind of a sequence of things that happen. Colonial violence, colonial eraser, amnesia. So when things are put off people's radar, they have an amnesia like they forget. And that's the impact of when we think, oh my gosh, we forgot to invite you know, whoever to our table in our planning committee. That's why this tool is really important. I've been in education for most of my uh, career now for about um, 30 years. I've been in social work education and it is still, we are still combating this erasure and this amnesia and the, uh, and, and the impact of this amnesia in the ongoing omission of truths and knowledges so we can actually address and make changes that are, that are relevant, that are responsible, that are accountable, that actually do what many people's rhetorical mission statements say they're set out to do around this era of indigenization. And so, um, you know, we have the knowledge and like Senator Murray St. Clair says, we have the knowledge, we have to arm ourselves now with the knowledge. And so these kind of quizzes give you a little bit of a flag to say, oh, do I know anything about that? Let's talk about this. So I invite you and your teams to have, to begin having conversations about this as, as a starting point to identifying where does knowledge building need to, need to happen? Where does knowledge exist? Who carries what knowledge in what areas that you can actually draw upon? So that when you're planning, you might say, hey, I want to invite um, Mary Alice, because Mary Alice knows a lot about the treaties in this area, or so and so. So has a relationship with the Friendship Center, maybe we can invite them. And maybe that's a segue or a doorway to beginning to, to, to build relationships of inclusivity. So when colonial violence causes an erasure because of um, trying to eradicate Indigenous knowledge, and the Indian Residential School was about that eradication of, of knowledge of who Indigenous children were, so that you know, colonialism is about the land. It's always been about the land. 
about exploitation and extraction of the land and resources for economic gain and greed and power, capitalism, all of those things. And so when you have that, so if you can erase from people's minds who they are and their connection and from the consciousness of society, then there's this, um, there's this doorway that happens where, where governments or whoever don't have to be accountable to the, um, the harm that's been caused. This will lead to that amnesia. And when the, the amnesia means then we're not talking about how to include. And colonialism has been about exclusion. It's been about excluding Indigenous peoples from land, excluding Indigenous children, excluding. Um, it's been about separating and excluding. That's what the mechanisms of colonialism continue to do, both within society today. And, and today, it's not with just Indigenous people. It's with all people that somehow we are being disconnected and severed from our relationship to where life comes from, from the land. And so when we think about inclusion and inclusion lens, it's like now, how do we come back to, how to return, how do we restore our consciousness to uh, talk? And you know, by the way, I'll, I will also say that for indigenous peoples, wellness is about relationship to the land. For Indigenous peoples, we have always known that the land gives us life. That the earth is our mother, that the moon is our grandmother, that the sun is our grandfather, that is our original family. We have always known that the water sustains us and the water is sacred. The air sustains us, the trees sustain us, and all the plants and animals in creation are medicine and food that sustain us. And we were here last in our creation story. The humans came last. Everything in creation was here first. And so with that knowing and that line of uh, thinking that um, mental wellness and mental health promotion for indigenous peoples has to be about restoring relationship and restoring relationship to the land. Because we know that wellness is in direct connection with the land, with the earth, with the medicines. And everything that I started with, the drum and the medicines and the song, this all comes from creation. It all comes from the earth. And so uh, did anybody have a chance to look at the competency quiz? And is there anything that you want to share with, share about that? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll keep moving on then. Uh, that's so sorry, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it looks like Lindsay has, uh, Lindsay? has her hand oh. up. Yep. Oh, go ahead, Lindsay. Hi, Hi. sorry, I think my camera's off. I, I've, I've been turning it on and off just because I'm not feeling well, but I am here and I'm present. Um, uh, I don't have anything to speak to specifically uh, about the quiz, but I just uh, wanted to thank you. Um, I find it really hard sometimes to explain colonialism, especially especially just to like friends and family, obviously people I work with, uh, you know, at the public health agency and work with many indigenous people. Uh, but it's really hard to explain sometimes. And I found that you really uh, explained in a way that is so easy to understand. Uh, like when you talked about, you know, the violence, the uh, amnesia and, and uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much for that. But uh, really inclusion for me uh, from, just the beginning of any kind of project is really important. Uh, even as an Indigenous person, it doesn't mean I understand everything about the experiences of other Indigenous people. So for example, I'm one of my projects, I'm working with uh, people from Akwesasne and I'm not Mohawk. My grandmother did live at Akwesasne for a while, but uh, the, the, the point is, um, you know, they approached me about a project. It's something that they, they feel is really important wasn't me saying, hey, you know, we need to do this uh, and it's not relevant. Uh, and just um, knowing what my responsibilities are, um, what their responsibilities are, um, 
how we're working together, how we're using two-eyed seeing, just having everything laid out from the beginning to the end, you know, with the knowledge translation piece sort of embedded throughout so that the community is getting all of the information about what it is that we're doing and have input uh, throughout the way. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of this uh, webinar because um, I just love that that inclusion piece is, I think it's the most important, so thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I was asked to write an article, oh, I don't know, a few years ago. It's called um, a holistic um, knowledge set. It's about, um, uh, I, I even forget what it was called, <laughs> but I named my own article. <laughs> I think I called it uh, uh, Indigenous Inclusion, a, whole net, let, a holistic knowledge set. It was for the Journal of Social Inclusion anyways, and um, as an international journal. But I actually based the Indigenous lens on that article that I had written about four years ago, four or five years ago. And, and in my experience, and you know, I worked in Native mental health for seven years in my home communities. I was a Native mental health program coordinator up in Perry Sound up and down the Highway 69 corridor between Doki's First Nation and Wakta First Nation. And I worked with seven First Nation communities in my home area. And so I, I have a, a knowledge base of what the nature of your work is about. And the um, and I and because of that erasure and because of the amnesia, I was always dealing with um, mainstream organizations as a native mental health program that that forgot to include us in community based planning they forgot and it wasn't it wasn't necessarily malicious these were nice people it was that they forgot it was off their radar they didn't have a consciousness of it and that is what um, the colonial erasure that's the impact pact of it it's like it's sweeped clear your mind. So you're not thinking about things. It's like what's happened with the uh, consciousness of the, those tiny bodies and the accountability of governments and churches for that in, in this society. And so the, so, uh, you know, inclusion is a really important thing to think about. It's an important thing that we have to consciously, um, reach for. I teach and I've been in part of faculties in social work, Indigenous programs in within the universities. And, you know, my whole, my whole working career has been about bringing into people's consciousness, uh, colonialism and Indigenous people's um, experiences in this, in this society. And it is, uh, I think that it's an ongoing reflection of like when my colleagues say, and we'll say, you know, we might be thinking about something simple like graduation planning or doing something in the Indigenous program isn't included. And I'll come to a meeting going, hello, you know, our program is the leading Indigenous graduate social work program in the country and even at my own faculty forgets to include us in planning and so this is like and then when I say you know don't forget about us or what about this I'm constantly putting that lens mm -hmm. on people's radar and so I'm going to continue to share my screen here with you and because uh, I you know what I have to keep moving because I'm like, feel like, oh, I'm on the time. <laughs> so uh, there, some of this is, in, is already in the lens and it's just an overview, but you know, this lens is for all of you. That's who I had in mind. That's who Barb um, and the KDE hub um, talked about. So this lens has been created specifically for all of you to offer you that, um, that other, that additional, it's like helping you to put on another pair of glasses. It's like helping you to see sometimes 
what you may, um, that's just, it's not on your radar. And it's not on your radar because education has constructed that to be like that. And has omitted, uh, has, has omitted so much in history and context and experiences that, that even when people are reading a roadmap, you still don't see Indigenous nations on roadmaps or on um, Google Maps people are using today. I'm of the generation where we had the big roadmap out on in the car, <laughs> blowing out the wind. But today people are using GPS systems. So the lens, it's a set of eyes and it has been created from an indigenous perspective. It's been created from, um, through my work, through my experiences of working in native mental health over the years, through my experience of being on the other end of the table and of saying, don't forget, don't forget, what about this? What about that? And it's been, it's been created to also um, combat the erasure. It's, and the lens will foster a consciousness and a presence of including uh, whoever that might be, community members, elders, youth, family members, and I'm hoping that within your teams and within each of your projects that the lens fosters conversations, that it fosters dialogue and relationships amongst your team to talk about things that often aren't talked about. And we're like, well, what about this? Or what about that? And if there are things that aren't in the lens, then you, know, you can add them depending on your context. And that this lens is um, this extra set of eyes, and you know they're pretty much through through my eyes of um, of um, not only being um, on the outside saying, "Hey, what about tapping?" You know, mainstream on the shoulders. It's like sitting on the outside of the circle and tapping mainstream on the shoulders to say, "What about indigenous people?" Hello, let us in the room, let us at the table. And we are always trying to find a seat at a table where decisions are being made that involve us, that involve our land, that involve our community. And I think today it doesn't matter where you are, in urban or rural, there's, there's a need to have Indigenous people sitting at that table involved in the planning in some way. And so my hope is that this lens is, helps offer you a guide for a pathway forward that you can use this to begin to create um, projects that that include indigenous peoples and you know we want to move into um so i'm kind of i'm going over this really quickly i acknowledge that and part of that is because people have the tool and I want to go over briefly, do an overview of this tool in terms of this is a holistic guide. This is a holistic lens. And there, it, I broke it down into four quadrants. And you can see that in, um, in beginning with the spirit quadrant of the East, that this is where, you know, as a project, and this is on page seven of your tool. So when each of you go into breakout rooms, you can, the, the, there'll be four breakout groups. Each group will be spirit, heart, mind, and body physical. Eric's going to help you go into your breakout groups so that you have more time to sit together and actually think about, and I'm, and I've given you, I'm going to give you a scenario in a minute about your activity, but this is a this is a holistic overview, and this diagram is also in your tool that I've created for you. the The spirit involves your vision. What's your vision? Um, it gives you questions that relate to culture. It gives you questions that relate to the inclusion of elders and cultural identity. The heart section asks you questions that foster relationship building and ask you to. Think about the impacts of trauma and how do you begin 
um, creating pathways to to engage in either foster healthy relationships within your your populations that you're working with or with it with indigenous communities and indigenous peoples and organizations um, the the mental element gets you to think about asks you questions in relationship to what knowledge exists and what knowledge do you need. so as a team you start to build knowledge based on your existing experience your existing knowledge and your um the um and and the collectivity that you're working with in this element it gets you to think about you know what does decolonizing knowledge look like what's needed and it gets you to think about you know the role indigenous knowledge plays and that might relate directly across to the elders or involving the people in the community that have that knowledge the physical element of your tool speaks to, you know, awareness and questions that speak to issues of physicality, like the location of your meetings or the location of your planning. Um, have you ever thought about going and seeing if you can have a space at a friendship center? Have you ever thought about invite ha, the, the land or the place in which you're, you're meeting, the space, what's the space like? and where what you're going to do further and so um i'm um linda was that uh lindsay lindsay sorry sorry i know you're in a hurry so i just wanted to mention this because it came up in my mind but um i was actually in a community uh in my master's work working on a mobility project uh, mo mobility and cultural revitalization and uh, somebody outside of the community had been hosting, um, uh, it was a, a project on uh, improving the, the land in the community to make it more uh, mobile for people using like wheelchairs, electric devices. Anyway, so they invited the people in the community, including those with disabilities, because they wanted to have uh, everyone present, but they, the the spot they chose was not accessible mm -hmm. so pe nobody could get in like anybody with a wheelchair or a, you know so those minor things of going to see the you know the space the land where you're holding these things who who is it accessible to including things like you know lighting um noise you know because there's people who have other disabilities as well uh, but anyway just a really important thing to go and check out and ensure that uh, the spaces are, are. Thank you very much. That that's so important. Actually, we've been talking about that a lot. Actually, about accessibility and that spaces are are um, workable for the audience and the people that you want to invite. Especially if you want to have elders, you have to make sure that people can, if they have a walker or a wheelchair, that they can be accessible. So, I appreciate that. So we're going to prepare into um, working the tool. So I wanna get you active and talking with each other. This is gonna be 30 minutes. And um, there's a project infographics on YouTube. I'm not gonna show it, it's only three, it's only two and a half minutes long, but you can go on there and it's actually on your website. I wanted to, I wanted to highlight that to you because if you want to learn about some of the other projects that are there and what other projects are doing, this is good. So you're going to break up into four groups and with so group one will take spirit group two will take heart group three will take mind and group four will take physical and here's your scenario is that you're you're part of this working group to build inclusion of indigenous children and youth into your project. Inclusion of um, Indigenous truth, mental, Indigenous children and youth mental health, wellness and promotion. You have a lot of will and desire to do better. And I know that everybody here comes with that because you were doing this work. And we say that people that are working for the wellness of the people, you know what we call people like you? We say you're the creator's helpers. So we know when, when we're working with people who are the creator's helpers, that there is will and a desire to do better and build 
um, and to make change. And so with this will and desire to do better and build Indigenous perspectives into the planning and development of your project, you will, um, and like many planners in Canada, your team has limited knowledge with limited existing relations with Indigenous peoples and community and may have little experience. So rather than the standard deny and avoid, let's think about how we can step forward into inclusion. And so your site could be an urban site or a rural site, you can choose however most of the sites seem to be urban from when I've looked over the, um, the projects in the breakout rooms and as a team move through the questions related to your project and ask someone to record what you come up with and members of the kde tub hub are going to join you i said the kde tub the kde hub are going to each there's going to be one person that's going to be in your breakout room with you so when you come back i'm hoping that we'll have time to ask somebody from each group to share what your group's emerging ideas are so that collectively, by the time everybody shares, everybody's had a chance to get a holistic idea of how this, how this tool works holistically. And because of the amount of time we have, each person can work in one area. Um, so does, um, I'll stop sharing now. Is that okay, Mary Alice? If I stop sharing, everybody has this, right? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. That's good. So, um, Eric is going to put you all into breakout rooms, and he's already done this. So, this is an amazing, like, organized team. And I will see you back here in, at 2. Okay, it sounds like is everybody back, Eric? Great. Welcome back, everybody. I hope that uh, you had a good conversation in each of your groups. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing what uh, kinds of uh, things came out of your conversations from each of your, each of your directions and each of your elements. And so maybe we will begin with the the we're going to begin because of our of our our, um, our time and get I think that we said we would give each group about um, I think we said each group would have four groups 10 20 30 40 no it wouldn't be for 10 minutes I think we said maybe five minutes yeah, about right yep Okay, five minutes for each group to share. So if we can begin with the group that was talking about the, the heart element and focusing on that piece of the, uh, the toolkit and the questions related to heart. And, and that is the element that talks about strengthening um, Indigenous people in the, in the uh, planning process in... Let me see, where's my heart? Yes. Is the person who's reporting or speaking, or maybe it's the whole group, I don't know, but you have five minutes. Who might that be? Well, I, I'll start, but um, I'd invite any of the group members to jump in. We didn't really decide on who was gonna do the report back, but uh, Danica, Leandra, Gina, Marlene, and I had a wonderful conversation, so. Um, feel free to jump in. I'm going to try to read my uh, chicken scratches here as I go. Um, but we did talk about sort of the that how important relationship is. And we kind of started um, our conversation talking about it, it seems like the best place to start is, is by starting to build relationships. Um, and I think we, we um, uh, as the conversation went on, we also kind of wandered it a little bit into the um, section on mind in terms of really sort of educating ourselves when we go into relationships. So I think we, we sort of did a little bit of a blend there. Um, but we talked about making sure that the, the building the relationship is intentional and beyond tokenism. And that um, sometimes we invite relationship, but then 
um, we don't consider the power sharing and it can be about ticking a box and, and what a misstep that is and that that you know that builds more distrust um, and reluctance and then um, and we talked about thinking about who's at the table and also who's not at the table so in developing a program if it's not attractive um, to some then why not and so sort of um, developing a relationship and then giving over some uh, co-mentorship so you can learn from those you're um, relating to uh, learning from them and um, developing like maybe reimagining your program um, and learning from knowledge holders learning from elders and um, Marlene gave a good example about how their program has um, undergone some transition through their work with Indigenous communities. Um, and I loved when Marlene, I loved it when you said this, I wrote this down, um, that it's that this is a process and it's a long process, but it's a process that doesn't have an end, but it should always have a beginning. Um, and so uh, that really liked that part of that. Um, and we talked about that diversity, um, there's the also to consider the intersections of diversity that we're not just talking about one group talking to one group but that we all come with a, a mixture of diversities um and we talked about um how do you broker those initial relationships how do you come into relationship and you know that is one of the things that takes time um and um we talked about coming uh from things um, with the strengths-based approach, um, recognizing and coming with some cultural humility about our own training and our own background and our all own presuppositions. And then how do we work with groups to reclaim their cultural wisdom? And then how do we learn from that cultural wisdom and, and start with there and, and build some empathy um, to then have some common sort of starting ground? So that's my chicken scratches. Did anybody from the group want to um, expound on that or clarify anything I've said? Okay, miigwech. Miigwech, and um, I will, I'll, I, I think it's true and I, one of the things that I that I talk about in terms of relationship building and inclusion is everything begins with an invitation. So in the if you do not have indigenous people in your project, it just takes an invitation. And sometimes I have heard where people say we've invited them and we haven't they haven't responded or whatnot. And I think that that's important to, um, with that intention, building relationship intentionally means persistence. And re recognizing that in some areas, there might be a history of tokenism. There might be a history of um, in ingenious, ingenuine, ingenuine um, attempts. And so you have to be, uh, that intention and that persistence is really important. And, and I always think it's important to go and visit, like, you know, put on your shoes and your coat, march down the street or go down and be a, kind of find a way to become a part of and get involved in the context uh, that Indigenous people are in. Go to the Friendship Center, go to the mental health, Native mental health services if there's any go to the community, go to the band office, uh, go and, and introduce yourself and make those invitations genuine. That's how you do it. Just email and phone sometimes isn't enough. It's not, it doesn't um, heighten the relationship. And, so, and when you see somebody there, that really can make a difference. Thank you very much, Mary Alice, for representing the heart group. And what about the spirit group? I can uh, also try to interpret my uh, chicken scratch there, Mary Alice, you did such a great job. <laughs> I don't know if I can. Um, 
So, but I think I'll just start with some um, overall impressions and uh, and please others from the spirit room, you're more than like, I, I'd love for you to, to jump in with uh, with your reflections as well about our discussion. We, uh, I thought it was such an amazing discussion. I feel like uh, it could have gone on <laughs> for sure. And uh, so thank you. Um, so yeah, so overall, I think impressions that were shared were, um, that if you are working from a place of inclusion, the things that were represented in uh, the spirit component of the tool, that you would be accomplishing those things if you are involving um, the right people from the beginning um, and having that respectful inclusion that a lot of the things that are sort of in this checklist would hopefully be accomplished. Um, and just how difficult it is to get um, that idea of, of like a holistic, um, almost like, like a, a circle into, into this kind of linear checklist. It was almost like a, a bit of a, you know, um, a difference there and how, and I think that's just a, a limitation of the written word and, and how we can present things a little bit. But, um, and then one thing that we also, or that somebody brought up was uh, as part of this, this list, what also could be included was the importance of languages and revitalizing languages as part of, as part of the spirit work. Um, and, uh, and then we uh, had a, a good conversation, some great sharing at the project level um, about what it means or it might mean um, to, to, in, to include the spirit element. Um, and so one of the examples shared uh, as part of um, some work that I believe it was Tony from the Students Commission Canada um, was sharing was um, meaningful participation that connects you outside of yourselves. So that kind of being part of the, the, the program um, and how to kind of, uh, so they were talking about using elements of, um, you know, like head and feet and hands and then that spirit part being um, the contributions of, of things that fall outside of, of kind of like the immediate uh, person, I suppose. If I'm recalling that right, Sonia, you, you might jump in to correct that. Um, and uh, and then, yeah, so kind of picking up also on what Mary Alice was talking about, we did talk about who, who is in the room, who needs to be in the room, and how to tailor uh, practices based on that. Um, and so that it includes, you know, um, ceremony and, uh, and, and that should all represent the context um, and be appropriate to, um, you know, the, the geography and the cultures um, that we're thinking of engaging. Um, and then we talked about uh, just some reflections about like uh, if you are working with organizations who or individuals who don't come from um, who don't tend to come maybe consider or, or bring spirit into their work. Uh, how there might be some fear there involved because it might be a different way of thinking about things. Um, but also that there's a felt sense of excitement and attraction to that as well. Um, and then in practice, just some examples shared of, of what one might do to uh, bring the spirit element uh, into work is thinking about things like how to organize a room, um, how to establish um, maybe some protocols or practices for entering and exiting um, the space or the room or the time together. Uh, our kind of use of silence and not trying to to fill in, you know, with speaking constantly and kind of listening, um, and uh, and yeah, uh, making space for ceremony, and um, yeah, that was kind of on that. Oh, the other one too was just our having a uh, being mindful of our col col colonized notion of time. And you know, um, perhaps being a bit more patient as well, uh, and having some services uh, in case anything should occur that you know is triggering or brings up uh, discomfort. So to have some space uh, for folks to sit outside of circle if needed. 
and then our conversation turned to cultural humility as well. So I know Mary Alice just said that and, and kind of that introspective quality and, and um, being self-aware enough so that you can learn from another and, and from their culture. Um, and, uh, and then how important that is to not only do that on an individual level, uh, at a project level, at an organization level, but also at a system level to have the cultural humility and uh, and, may, and then one suggestion of, of how we might bring that to the system level was simply just to do it, like to do it as an individual maybe and to do it as an organization and to set the example um, of, and, and some of those things we, we, we talked about maybe like um, starting with ceremony and just kind of normalizing that that's the way we do things. So I'll just, uh, anybody else who wants to jump in, please feel free. Miigwech for bringing your group's perspective forward. A couple of things that I would um, add to what you already said was that um, when, you're, um, when you're wanting to involve Indigenous peoples to, um, to um, build awareness around protocols and things like that, I think that it's, you know, I, I would, um, invite people on the team to learn aspects of the language of the territory you're in. So if you're in, um, you know, Winnipeg, where there's Anishinaabek, Cree, uh, Métis, you know, there's, there, there, there's different ways you say, Tanse, Bojo, Anin, um, and how you say the basics, how you, how you say a greeting, how you say welcome, how you say Thank you. So I uh, invite you to learn to do some concrete things like that, like learn the language, learn aspects of the language. And um, that shows um, a willingness to engage from a place of, um, of indigenous, where Indigenous people are at. And, and, and for me, that's always like impressed me where I'm like, wow, they've, they, they're, they're, they're using our language. And um, to me, I find that is um, a sign of like stepping into that treaty relationship. Like we can acknowledge, have territorial acknowledgements and we can say we're, you know, we're in, we're in this treaty territory, but what does that mean in terms of the language? And so it's, it's, it's showing that, you know, all Canadians have a treaty relationship with Indigenous people. So learning to say some things in the language I think is good. And then specifically when you're inviting community people to be involved, to lift up ceremony, to lift up um, Indigenous knowledge, uh, practices, uh, invitation for community representatives, remember to put those into your budget. That's not something that people will do for free. And it is not our knowledge much like a consultant, much like you would bring a contractor in, an elder has the similar credentials as somebody like me who's a doctor. They have lifelong knowledge, lifelong wisdom, and, and you know, don't treat Indigenous people as if our, our, our expertise, our experiences are up for free. So be prepared to factor that into your your budgets and you know into your how how you how you um, include those voices and so um, the uh, and you know I think that the beginning conversations are important because then you can get into the the the, the specifics and the details depending on your context and so um, I'm going to move us along to the element of the mental element and invite the person to share that with us. Um, I'm happy to jump in and also, as everyone else has said, open to the rest of my group to kind of fill in any blanks. Um, we first uh, started uh, by almost sharing um, our own experiences, even um, in terms of like having, being part of Indigenous training and cultural safety training and, and, and realizing how much we think we might know, but how much we don't know. Um, and the importance of including those kinds of training, um, the importance of including or having resources available for your entire team to really understand, to get that knowledge. Um, and, and yeah, I think we just talked about how it's shocking to find out how much you don't actually know when you think that you might <laughs> um, 
have a sense. Um, and also in terms of like just being able to go out to the community, um, we talked a little bit about the importance of going into the community and learning from the communities that are around you. Um, like one example was involving an elder within um, your team was what, what one person has shared. Um, and often that there's some, not necessarily like a fear, but it's, are you allowed to go out to, you know, an Indigenous community to, or into a specific place to ask those types of questions and not to be afraid to do that. Um, another example was even just learning, um, I think one person brought up about a uh, uh, workshop about two spirit. And so even just that learning um, and to be able to apply that. So again, just trying to increase as much knowledge as you can. Um, also, uh, having a list of services, um, maybe even an assembly of resources that is available to your team um, so, so everybody can learn alongside of each other. Um, we talked um, a little bit about building an understanding that colonialism isn't necessarily historical, but it's, it's continuously evolving and to make sure that that consciousness is available in your team. Um, we talked... Um, yeah, about the diversity within having projects be able to have that diversity in terms of working with Indigenous populations. Um, and we also, um, like you had mentioned before, uh, we also had that realization of it's not necessarily waiting for an Indigenous community or an Indigenous group to reach out to you, but the importance of you not waiting, but going out and inviting them to the table and how that's a very, very important step. Um, and again, touching on that sort of the potential nervousness that people might have about reaching out and how, to, how do you do that appropriately. And sometimes that that is a challenge that people feel that they may need to overcome, but also about that's how we would learn more and that's the best way forward. Um, we also, again, reading through my chicken scratch. Um, we also talked um, about the importance in terms of knowledge development about the importance of um, involving indigenous groups um, in the directions of all the re in, in the directions of research, including the development, the implementation, um, and and that how that knowledge is then shared and to make sure that that is coming straight from the indigenous populations that you're working with, um, and. Yeah, the, just the importance of that element of co-design. So not necessarily putting something. Yeah, I guess listening to their voices and and fo and following their lead, um, following their expertise for what's appropriate as well. Um, and we we left off um, just um, on on a reflection about uh, the the wealth of Indigenous youth and how that is um, one particular group that I think that we should all be learning a lot um, from and, and going towards, again, for that element of co-design, co-mentoring, um, but just sort of the wealth of knowledge in terms of that youth-led mentoring um, and the importance of that in terms of building new knowledge. And I can open it up to anybody else if I've missed anything. Liza gives you a thumbs up. Miigwech. Um, I think that that's, uh, that's a pretty good beginning conversation of um, addressing the knowledges and knowledge building. And um, I find that in times when I've taught Indigenous um, knowledge courses and decolonizing uh, courses, it's it's so true, Renata, that the more you learn, the less you realize you know. And because Indigenous, um, you know, people have degrees on Indigenous studies, undergraduate degrees and masters, and people are doing PhDs. There's so much to know, and the more the little bit you learn, the more you realize. I mean, with knowledge comes. Um, awareness of how much more there is to learn and with knowledge comes its uh, uh, responsibility to to change the eraser to change ignorance to address and combat that amnesia and um, the more that you talk and 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 even engage in ongoing training um, because there's so much that we're learning too around even um, you know, um, within two-spirit LGBTQ communities, 
um, around what was said earlier about ability and accessibility and um, youth perspectives and um, inclusion of though of different voices depending on again where you're from and so knowledge building is always important i don't know about any of you but i've never stopped learning and when you're when you're a helper within communities you're always always learning and so there's always this this searching this research aspect to learning of um so that you can um you know and it's important to, to give yourself permission to make mistakes i think that sometimes gets in the way of um moving forward i think sometimes a fear of doing something wrong especially within in the era of um truth and reconciliation and the politics uh that are happening across the country that you might you know that can get in the way of taking a step forward of thinking that you're going to say or do something wrong trust me we're not that fragile um we've been through the 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 the, the mill and back and um there is and i think that cultural humility because when i've come into partnerships or in with organizations um if i can have a conversation about the whiteness about the dominance of colonialism about eurocentrism and have the people in there sit with me and talk about that then i know that i can be in partnership with them but if white fragility and other things come into place then you know what i can't be in partnership with people like that i'm not there to educate people i'm not there to um to um, carry their knowledge i'm not there to teach them about the history i'm there to be a partner so really you have to do your work to to learn about the history you have to familiarize yourself with with all of the the huge amount of knowledge and commissions and inquiries that are already out there and they're all available online then we can come to a table and then i can those are the kind of people that i'm in partnership with the people that are doing their work and are waking up and and because i have working partnerships with non-indigenous groups but they're and they're doing their work so and i'm not there to educate them so they come to the table with some really good questions that i can actually engage in and have have good conversations so i want to move on to the group that did the physical oh lynn lindsay yeah so i just wanted to say thank you for saying that um I know that um, these conversations can be hard and and I really worry about trauma, uh, like triggering people's trauma and not because I've necessarily done it, but just because I've seen it happen to others and to myself sometimes through just a really good question that people just don't realize, like you can't plan for it, it's it happens. So I think if we have, you know, things in place for when that happens, um, which is easier done in person because you can kind of recognize sometimes when something has triggered somebody and you can, you know, smudge or, you know, uh, you know, help them help each other through it. But um, I just wanted to mention as much as I say that I still do worry about, uh, you know, my own trauma and others people, uh, people's trauma, but something we have to face for sure. And, and thank you so much for that, Lindsay, because knowledge building isn't about um, trauma porn having people tell you their their experiences and you know survivor stories that that's not knowledge building you have to do your own work that's all available go to the truth and reconciliation website um healing foundations things like that so i'm going to move to the physical realm hello um, i'll make this brief um, I'm mindful of time and we've talked about a lot of this um, from other pro from other groups in our group. So one of the themes that came up immediately was um, creating advisory committees to gather guidance and um, evaluating progress within your project. So asking for support on the level of appropriateness for your event or program, um, inviting um, Indigenous perspectives. Um, to meet in person to build these relationships, as we've mentioned, but also to review goals and set expectations of one another. Um, another theme that came up related to that is viewing um, Indigenous con contributions as an equal partnership or an equal contribution that's supposed to be mutually beneficial and sustainable. 
Um, so a key part of a strong relationship is having similar motivations or being aligned on a common goal. Um, and so also in terms of if you're a non-Indigenous person, um, attending sharing circles or drum and prayer circles and being involved in Indigenous communities as much as possible to strengthen that relationship. Um, another thing that came up is continuously checking in with the community for doing a needs assessment um, because those may change, especially as we're talking about physical spaces. Um, in the times we're in right now, those aren't always accessible to be physically together. So checking in with the community that you're, you're targeting for this project is um, quite needed. Um, just scanning my notes really fast, but if, oh, another part of it was coordinating a consent process for whoever's involved in the project and thinking about barriers for those accessing it, such as if they're youth, are they in school? Can you even reach them through school? Like, where are they hanging out? Um, so keeping a, a mind to who's not in the room is also really important. Um, if anybody wants to add, please do, but that's me. Miigwech for that. Um, I think that um, in the time that everybody's had, everybody's had a really good opportunity to just begin to, you know, you've dipped your toes in to the conversations that are possible. And, and our hope is, is that you had an opportunity to begin to have a hands-on um, uh, experience with the tool and to see the tool as a guiding element and that you will continue to pull this tool forward and to have this tool inform your practices. And I guess my overall, my overall um, feedback is to remember to think about um, within your project, wherever you are from East Coast to West Coast, North to South in Canada, to, um, to um, take that um, look around your area and then to identify you know, some concrete things that you can do one step at a time to engage, to invite, to build relationships with. And then once you have those in place, really it's creating space to have your projects be informed by those. And um, the I, I think when you invite key indigenous people into your project and they, they take their they take up their place, they will do the work for them. And then you, they'll do their work and all they need to have is the space to do their work and for you to support that process. And um, so I see people nodding and perhaps that's been your experience too, is that when you invite people who are, who are relevant to, I'm not talking about inviting token, token Indian indigenous people who will be the occupy a seat and, and nod with what you're saying inviting people who understand the work, who understand the community, who have a voice and who, uh, who can um, help you or help take their place along the work with you. And uh, cause I've seen, you know, people invite indigenous people to take their place and they basically become the tick box. And they have no space to, um, genuinely inform the project but that people say oh we have an indigenous person on there and um so i i think that um there's a difference and so i thank you for inviting each i uh, thank you for engaging in the process today it's been a short two hours and um i thank you for your participation and um I'm grateful for your input into the tool. So it's interesting to hear as you, as you move along, ongoing feedback to the KDE Hub as, as the tool gets informed, it would be important. And so uh, let me see what else we're supposed to be doing. Closing remarks to the workshop. Okay. Me glitch everybody. I just hope you all have a really good afternoon and wherever you are, whatever part of the country, 
country, whose ever land you're on, you know, be good to yourself. And because really, you know, being being a helper and doing the creator's work begins with honoring your own spirit, honoring your heart, honoring your knowledge and honoring your vessel, your body. And that's what you bring to your practice. That's what you bring to your work is a grounded holistic self. And when you are grounded in your holistic self, you will have no problem building relationship from a good place, from a place of um, respect, from a place of relationality and um, having open conversations and dialogue where we can unpack the shit that's happened and, and, and unpack it in a truthful way. So, uh, and that's the kind of relationships we want to be in. We want to be in honest, truthful, humane relationships and, 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 and help make things better for our youth and our children in our communities, urban, rural, and in between. And if you can help us do that, I say miigwech to you. My hat, you know, I lift my hands to you. I say miigwech for um, beginning a process of inclusion within Indigenous peoples across this land. So, Jimmy Gwich. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, this was so inspiring. I think we've got a lot of food for thought and uh, and 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 things to think about and, and to act on. So just want to really extend uh, our thanks to you uh, for taking the time uh, on behalf of the hub and everybody that joined us today. Um, I know that we're, I think, all going to walk away from this thinking about it for a long time to come and hopefully revisiting. Um, so uh, all those who, who join us, thank you very much. If you have to sign off, please go ahead. Kathy, we just have this um, very modest gift to say thank you. Um, just some hub swag that I think Eric is going to hold up. So we'll send that your way <laughs> just to say a thanks again for for spending time with us today um those sorry go ahead kathy <laughs> were you going to say something uh, and uh, just three really short plugs uh, to project teams. Um, you got the uh, information about the annual symposium, so please register, forward it with, within your networks to those that you think would be interested. And then we had the two small requests, um, pre-symposium, pre please check out your gallery space and, um, and think about a, a video that you might be willing to uh, develop and share with us that maybe showcases your project or uh, features some participant voices, whatever you want. Um, so that, that's Basically, have a, a great weekend, everybody. This is such an awesome way to uh, end the week. So thanks again. Take care. Thank you, McWitch.